Hello and welcome to this tutorial about profiling an application with the Intel Vitium Profiler. My name is Martin Ernst and I work at the Pleiades Computing Facility at the University of Wuppertal. In previous tutorials we have learned what Vitium is, how to create a first profile and we have reminded ourselves about important CPU architecture concepts. In this tutorial we want to dive deeper into different Vitium analysis types and how they differ. Popular examples are the hotspots analysis, memory access and threading analysis types. You typically start with a generic analysis type and select a specific one if there is a reason to focus on a certain topic. We will reuse the simple example from our introduction tutorial. The program is simply adding and multiplying two random vectors v1 and v2. The outer loop is just a way to artificially increase the workload by repeating everything. But in this tutorial we consider three versions of our program. First we do the vector operations in a single sequential process. In the second version, we use an OpenMP pragma to use vectorized instructions for the vector addition and multiplication. In the third version, we additionally use pragma OMP parallel 4 to parallelize the outer loop with threads. This example is intended to be mostly educational and the program itself is not very useful. This is how Vtune presents all available analysis types. The performance snapshot was covered in the introduction tutorial. This analysis type can help as a guide through all available options by assessing its measurements and recommending what analysis types to consider next. For the sequential execution of our application, we were recommended to run a hotspot, microarchitecture, HPC and threading analysis next. In this tutorial, we will discuss the results of a hotspot analysis in detail, but also go over the intentions behind the other types as well. Looking at the other analysis types, we can observe a different level of detail. At the top you find types that focus on the algorithmic optimization and low-level architecture details. On the next level you zoom out a bit to parallelization and I.O. aspects. And finally at the bottom you can find analysis types intended for accelerators and the whole platform. The collected metrics and how measurements are presented usually differs between each analysis type. They might collect the same data but the presentation puts emphasis on the topic the analysis type is trying to address. The hotspot analysis type can help with finding hotspots in your application. Hotspots are code sections where the program spends most of its time. This could be a single inefficient function that is called many times for example. This analysis type can be used in a user or a hardware sampling mode. Hardware sampling can gather more information in shorter time intervals but requires the previously mentioned sampling driver or enabled Linux perf collection. You also have the option to collect call stacks which will bring code sections in a hierarchical structure of where it is called from and what functions it is calling itself. This is increasing the collection overhead and result size, so you should think about if it is necessary or not. In a first hotspot analysis, it can be useful to collect call stacks to get a better understanding of how the application is structured. Dependent on the sampling mode and the configuration, the hotspots analysis will have differently sized sampling intervals and overhead during collection. In this example, we are configuring a hotspots analysis for our test application. We enable the hardware sampling mode and notice that Vtune provides an estimate of how much of a time overhead we have to expect with the current configuration. We also enable the collection of call stacks, which increases the overhead estimate. Note that all options show a very descriptive help text if you hover your mouse over it. The summary page collects the most important results and serves as a guide of what to look for. On the top left we see elapsed time and a collection of summarizing metrics. Problems are usually highlighted in red. It is not always an indication that something is wrong though. Some applications are just throttled by memory throughput for example and in this case profiles will always highlight this bottleneck, even if the application is very optimized in this regard. But it is always a good place to start and look into these results and try to understand how they come about. Here the microarchitecture usage is marked as low. Below you have a top 5 list of the largest hotspots. The function and the module names can help you identify which part of your code section is causing these hotspots. Here we spend most of the time in the do computation function, which contains our example code with the vector addition and multiplication. Sometimes when you profile your application for the very first time, you find that a single function is responsible for a very large fraction of the total execution time. 
this is usually the best point to start with an optimization effort. If you see standard library methods like the vector access operator or memset methods, you usually can only think about how to use them differently. So in a sense, we start to think about how to use standard methods to decrease their impact and look for ways to use available resources more efficiently. On the top right, you can find a couple of insights that tell you how to proceed. It already mentions that we have poor parallelism. This is expected since we ran our program sequentially for now. Additionally, we have a poor utilization of available CPU capabilities expressed by the microarchitecture usage percentage. The CPU utilization histogram at the bottom is not too useful for a single-threaded application. In our case, we run with a single thread the whole time. The bottom-up view gives a detailed overview of all hotspots, ordered by CPU time spent in each section of the code. Available columns usually change per analysis type, so you expect to have different information here if you run a different analysis. On the right, the call stack of the current selected function is shown. The panel at the bottom shows a timeline of active processes and the CPU utilization. You can change the grouping of the information with a drop-down menu at the top. If you choose module function call stack, all methods from the same software library would be combined into a single entry. The bar at the bottom provides very useful filters. In multi-processed and multi-threaded applications, you can decide to only show data for a single thread or process. You can also decide to filter per module, which is especially useful if you only want to look into code that you control. We can also select to consider functions and loops separately. As you can see, VTU now identifies our expensive due computation function to actually be a loop. The cryptic function names are functions from standard libraries, as can be seen in the module column. This happens sometimes when you profile code without providing debug symbols through the dash g flag during compilation. My personal approach is to focus on methods that I control first and don't spend time on libraries I have little control over. Keep in mind, however, that you could have indirect inefficiencies where major hotspots is within one of the standard libraries, but this is essentially caused by how you use objects and functions from that library. If you see much time spent in memset, for example, you could be inefficient with your allocations. In this case, it might be useful to think about allocations and container types again. In the caller call lead tab, you see the same information as before, but presented from a different perspective. The upper panel on the right shows all callers. These are all functions where your function is called from. In this case, our do computation function is directly called by main. In the lower panel, you can see all callees. The functions, the currently selected function is calling itself. In this case, we only step into a loop of our vector operations. This view can be really useful to navigate up and down through the call stack. If the biggest hotspot is a standard library method, then this perspective can help you find the function in your code that is actually causing the problem. In the third representation of the data, the top-down tree, you can step from outside of the application through the call stack. The panels are the same as in the bottom-up view. Most of the time goes into the main function and subsequently the do computation method. Inside, we can see our loop that is causing multiple allocations and it contains another loop as well. The top-down tree can be useful if your program consists of multiple steps and you want to understand only one of these sections in detail. This is again very helpful with navigating through collected results of large applications. A popular way of presenting call stacks is the flame graph. It shows a breakdown of the function call stack in the timeline and can be useful to quickly identify suspicious code sections. Hotspots are likely to be stretched sections on the horizontal axis. The vertical shape of call stacks can give you hints about probably inefficient and frequent function calls as well. If there is an overhead associated with stepping into a function, you might want to make sure to call it once instead of many times. In the platform tab, we see the same timeline of process activities as before. The available data depends on the analysis type as well. Others will show you I.O. or memory utilization graphs, for example. For our sequential example, this view does not provide much insight besides seeing a thread that works at 100% the whole time. So let's step into the multi-threaded version of our program for a second. Here we use OpenMP to parallelize repetitions of the vector additions and multiplication. We see multiple threads that start to utilize available resources after a certain initialization period. We can also see small green spikes in between, which indicate short idle periods. Since they occur at the same time between many threads, this may indicate some sort of synchronization between the threads or depends on the workload size per thread. 
At the bottom, we have a combined summary of the CPU utilization. There is also a source code viewer that can be entered by clicking on one of the corresponding functions in the other views. Here we select the inner loop of our example program containing only the vector addition and multiplication. If Vtune does not know about the source path, it would only show the assembly code of that function. Here we also provided the source code path in the project configuration as explained in the introduction tutorial. On the right we have similar metric columns as before, but now attributed to a single line of code. Keep in mind that this code annotation is a statistical process as well and can sometimes be misplaced to a line above or below. But if a single line is executing much slower, it is more likely for a sample to be attributed to this particular line. This type of source code information is very useful to find out where exactly you should start with optimizations. In this case we can see that a measurable amount of time is equally spent on both vector operations. Another useful analysis type is the microarchitecture exploration. It helps to understand the utilization of available CPU capabilities and answers questions like Is my application front-end or back-end bound? How often do I hit branch mispredictions or have risk DS? Compared to the hotspots analysis, the summary page of the microarchitecture analysis type goes into much more detail about microarchitecture utilization. It is focusing on combined high-level metrics that summarize the front-end, back-end and speculation behavior. 31% core bound means that the application spends 31% of the runtime waiting for calculations to finish. The summary is highlighting a poor port utilization and is also mentioning a bad vector capacity usage for example. For a different test application these numbers could look very different and may highlight problems with front end bound cycles instead. A perfect program on a given platform would have 100% retiring instructions with the least amount of instructions necessary to complete the task. This is not really a meaningful goal however, since this highly depends on your application and what it is trying to solve. In certain scenarios, you have no other choice but to run into some kind of bottleneck and try to utilize all available resources as good as you can. The list of metrics can be overwhelming, so be reminded that there are useful descriptions available by hovering over any metric with a pointer. These metric passports provide a definition and explain what is considered to be a good or bad result. They also provide context by giving examples of possible causes and quantify the potential improvement through optimization. The bottom-up view is very similar to the hotspot analysis. One difference is in the right panel, where the call stack is now replaced with a summary of the microarchitecture utilization. Our do computation function has a high level of retired instructions, but since these instructions are not vectorized, they are not the most useful instructions the CPU has to offer. So this is a good example where using vectorized instructions could still reduce the footprint of this function even though it has a high number of retired instructions. There are also more metric columns available. We can see the impact of each function on front-end, back-end and memory metrics. Keep in mind that you can always view how each line of your source code contribute to these metrics by clicking on any function name that interests you. There is another tab called Event Count. It presents collected hardware events which are used as the basis for all other high-level metrics. You can see a list of all hardware events for the selected function in the right panel as well. In my opinion, this tab is only useful if you are looking into a very specific problem or for educational purposes to learn how high-level metrics are composed of the actual hardware events. The threading analysis type is indeed intended for analyzing multi-threaded applications. This screenshot shows the parallel worker threads of our OpenMP parallelized example program and the timeline also shows information about time spent in logs marked in orange. The threading analysis type can help to find reasons of poor scaling behavior and gather information on time spent in logs. The summary page of this analysis type is presenting a much more meaningful histogram of the number of active threads. Here we can learn that some sections are sequential, some utilize half of the CPU and some utilize all available threads. The memory access and consumption analysis types measure memory allocation counts and sizes to help with optimizing memory usage. These analysis types provide a powerful approach to quickly identify problematic code sections that allocate a large chunk of memory or perform many small allocations. They can measure the memory bandwidth utilization as well as access to remote memory in MUMA systems. Keep in mind that these analysis types can quickly grow in size, so it is useful to focus on a very small test case here. 
the HPC performance characterization can help with analyzing aspects of an application in the HPC context. This mostly consists of CPU, memory and FPU utilization metrics. Here we execute our vectorized version of the test program with a single thread. The single thread still results in a poor core utilization, but at the bottom we can see 100% vectorization. There are more details available. For example, we can see that 256 bit wide registers are used, which corresponds to AVX2 instructions. The bottom up view shows a summary of the utilization metrics, as well as a very nice process activity graph in the timeline at the bottom. Memory bandwidth graphs are plotted here as well. We will not cover the remaining analysis types in detail. In any case, you should be aware that they exist. There are analysis types to measure I.O. performance and others provide an overview of the whole system. It is also possible to study code execution on accelerators like GPUs and FPGAs. Please consult the VTune documentation if you are interested to apply these analysis types in your project. This is everything you really need to make use of VTune and analyze your application. Identifying and solving a particular problem is really the hard part here and not the measurement itself. The interpretation of measurements really depends on the details of your situation. So my recommendation is to rely on the scientific method. Make a baseline measurement, form a hypothesis about what's going on with the compiled program on your platform, make a change and then measure again. A successful approach is to aim for a relative improvement with respect to a baseline measurement. It is useful to look up details like a metric definition in the reference material. But as mentioned in previous tutorials, it does make sense to only look up details that are relevant to an ongoing project and not try to learn everything in advance. Once you know how to start a profile and navigate through the results, you have everything you need to know about VTune. Be aware of the different analysis types and when to use them. But in the end, practice is the best way to learn any new tools.